Because I don't know if you know this, Chris loves Honky Tonk. <laughs> By the way, this is not a true story. I just met Chris. <laughs> but Chris really does. Saturday nights, he's a Honky Tonk guy. Because Chris likes to dance, but he doesn't like this freeform things that these kids are doing. Line dancing work for him. It doesn't. Line dancing is awesome, right? You still experience movement. You experience community. You can just fake and do what the person in front of you done. Come on, you've been to weddings. You just do that chicken dance like that person in front of you. And you hate when this thing shifts and you're in the front. <laughs> but Chris is good. Like, Chris is the kind of guy that he can get up front and nail it. And all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, Chris, where'd you come from? Where's that guy been? Right? That's what happens in the honky tonk bar. Now, he also likes the honky tonk bars because, you know, if he's mingling with people, they're the type of people who hang out there. The, the night starts kind of a little awkward socially at honky tonk bars. But by the end, everyone's buying each other a beer and everyone is uh, just enjoying each other's company. And he just, Loves this, however, he gets further and further into it, and he realizes that he's using the honky tonk bar as an analgesic to kill the pain of a fracture line in his emotional life or something. And the Holy Spirit starts to speak to him. Am I getting too close? <laughs> <laughs> he know me. No, no. He's darn charismatic. <laughs> they only respect privacy. Right? They're reading your mail. So, all that to say, you know, he's at a honky tonk bar and he's doing, and the Spirit slowly over the course of a couple of weeks and months just starts to show up more and more and enter into conversation with him. So one lady sitting there, he just, his eyes are open to his life, where it's headed, the trajectory. The spirit gives him a glimpse, like these people on this trajectory, although I will love you, I can't go the whole way there with you. He just gives it up to God that night. Goes out, falls asleep, crying in the front bucket, you know, the, the old bucket seat of his Ford pickup truck um, that has the headlights smashed off by a Louisville slugger because of the emotional <laughs> spading he'd done to so many women. So all the way, he's just laying there on that, and he's crying. He wakes up in one. And he wakes up, and because he has enough Christian um, history, he knows it's Sunday morning, I'm going to do church. And he looks across the street, and on one corner of that co intersection, there's a church, and he goes in, and he goes into a Pine Street church. And when he walks in, you know, he's still dressed in his stuff from the night before. He still has his Marlboros rolled up in his T-shirt. By the way, Marlboro Gold, he's not smoking Marlboro Reds. They're bad. They're bad. They're bad. <laughs> and he's got, you know, he's a name. He's one of these guys that inks himself based on things that he's so he's got the tattoos like Sherry, Monica, <laughs> Bobby with an eye, you know, and down the arm, all crossed out. Mom at the very bottom, we all know we return. Um, and the, the pastor looks at him, let's just say the pastor or the chief discipler, and he's going to say this, you know, or she's going to say this, um, hey, you don't need that anymore. And the relationships you were there, they have you on the wrong path, right? The cigarettes, come on, we both know they're an analgesic you were using to the pain or you were using them to be cool or something at some point and now you're both like geez we can burn all that right now what if he would have woke up and went to the church on the other corner and walked in to the reformational stream they might not say burn it they might say redeem it right they might actually look at his life and go where'd you say this happened at cotton eye joe's honky tonk bar let's go back there tonight and tell your friends what jesus just did in your life you see the subtle difference and, and he's like well man I, I just need to give that up like the beer and the cigarettes and this pastor might look at it, this discipler might look at him and say, do you realize it's not uh, about those cigarettes or not about whether you're drink or not drink? It's not about what goes into a person that defines them. It's what comes out of them. Like, so no, I don't think Jesus right now wants to deal with you with external. You're going to hear phrases like this from this group. Now, just to give you another hint of what the stream will do, um, if you're in one of its meetings, if you're in a leadership meeting in the Pious Stream Church, Tradition and the word are going to be a huge part of their hermeneutic, the discernment, the way they're doing it. Whereas the reformational stream, it's a bit more, um, now granted, they're not going to say they're not into the word, but it's a bit more if you're in a reformational stream meeting, it's like, oh, that's just Paul's and what's the spirit saying to us now in this context? And is the spirit doing something in our day that's specific to what's going on here? And this makes the pious stream nervous, doesn't it? And the pious stream gets nervous at the reformational stream and its emphasis on being among the people and deep contextualization and things like this and the pious. And so they end up writing books about each other, right? And they end up lobbing ideological hand grenades back and forth, right? And, and they end up uh, doing things to each other. Like at the, eventually, I, I, I sometimes joke about this, down through church, if you trace these two major headwaters, by the way, Psalm 42 says this, many rivers make glad the city of God, right? Um, that when you chase these two great streams, they tend to write books about each other that where this one, um, Pius calls the Reformation stream, um, Mystery Babel and the Great, the Mother of Harlots, they're lifting the cup of compromise, right? And the Reformational stream calls the Pius stream, 
the great beast in the book of Revelation, the great religious authority that has no power anymore. It's just, and they end up doing these things to each other. And you have to sit. And I don't have time to do this to you, but um, I could even give you a two-minute sermon from each other that you deeply identify with, you know? The pious stream is going to, you're going to, you're going to get to one of its sermons, and it's going to, the minister is going to stand in the pulpit if it's a word-driven church, and it's going to say something like, thank you for being here this morning. And let's just pause for a second and think about what I just said. I thanked you for coming to God's house, the God who measures the universe with the span of his hand, the God who can take a mass all of human power through the history and put them on the scales of heaven and they don't even register his dust. This radically other being to us, and I'm having to thank you for setting aside this hour and a half in your week. Heroic generosity, setting aside <laughs> an hour and a half this week. Come to worship the Lord Almighty. And the fact that this being would even cast a glance to us should drive us to our knees, don't you think? Don't you think we should respond to him? Now, there's a classic pious dream message. You're going to get deep identification with this set of partners based in this power and character of this deity. But if you're in the other church, you could hear something like this for two minutes. You know, I was driving here this morning. Oh, and you know what? I don't know about you. Why does God use people like me? Because I had a wife with, I had a fight with my spouse before getting out the door. Why are, why are kids always crazy on Sunday morning? I mean, why is it that I have to get here for early service? My wife shows up later with the kids, but why is Sunday morning just so chaos? Does the devil do that? Do I do that? Is there something in me? And I was in the car, and I climbed in the car to drive her this morning, and I was all worked up feeling like an unworthy vessel, and I felt like the Lord said to me, tell my people thank you. And I just sat there, I'm like, hold a second. First of all, I'm not a worthy vessel. Secondly, thank you. Tell my people thank you and that I'm proud of them, that they're among other people today. And I know you have busy lives. I know you have soccer games to get to. I know you have pot roast in the oven. But if the Lord just wants to say this, he wants to say thank you for conscientiously wasting time with me today. <laughs> and I don't know if I can fully receive that. Because that is a God who loves us for who we are and not for what we should be. And I know usually quote Brendan Manning or Henry Nowen or something. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, do both of those sermons resonate at one another? <laughs> back to schizophrenia, Miss Back Row. Um, and so what we've done, I think, in the church is we've tried to do what? We've tried to find a, a balance, right? And this is what I really wanted to talk about this morning. We, we actually try to find balance between these two historic streams. And I want you to think about balance for a second. Balance is actually a static state. If I had time to give you a physics lesson today, if the universe ever balanced out its heat, its highs and lows, it would become a black hole. A black hole is the only place we have in the universe that's actually experiencing complete balance. And so therefore, I'm going to suggest that the church was never meant to find balance. G.K. Chesterton was once asked, what is the church? In quote, he said, ah, the church. It's like a chariot pulled by a team of wild horses that only God can control. Mm -hmm. And I want to suggest to you that the church, potentially by design, has these two, what I would call, a tension at work, in, not a balance. That the Lord, it seems to historically have put two poles of, two, what I call them, two great headwaters. Richard Foster will break these into the six streams, if you've ever read Streams of Living Water, won't you, right? But backing up from that, I want to remind you, there appear to be these two poles. And think of it like the Earth. Why are we a planet and not an asteroid? Because we have two poles that are pulling on each other that give us an axis. It call, as a matter of fact, they're pulling in such a way that it tilts us, right? Which allows us to have a rotation, which allows us to have an orbit. And so if we trace back why we're not an asteroid, it's because we have two tensions at work. Now, here's the big one, though, if you're following this. What do you have to do if you try to live at one of the poles? you got to wear layers, <clears throat> don't you? You have to wear layers if you're going to try to fully live at one of the poles. Now, here's where this is where the church gets tricky. Because we are so untrained to deal with conflict and conversation with the other, we end up in conversation pushing ourselves further into the poles where we have to wear layers. And, there, and we have not mastered the art of the encounter in the space between us. The space on this planet we were actually meant to live is in the space between two poles. But you never want to get rid of those two poles, or else what are you again? A tumbling asteroid, right? 
And so I, I, I just have a heart, and granted, you can imagine in the social context of what's going to happen in the next 18 months in this country, right, mm -hmm. with an election cycle. And you can imagine whatever's going on in among Mennonites, or I could, I chat with Episcopals, I chat with Methodists, right? What, whatever it is, I want to remind us that there is, a, Peter says this, honor all. Right? And that is a bold statement to say in the book of Peter, at the, at what was going on. There is this, and I believe, I mean, Marislav Holt does some excellent stuff with this verse. Just simply to honor all is to understand the position from that which the person begins with, right? And something happens in the spirit in the space between us when we honor the other by understanding why they would even choose to be that. And so, you know, I, I, I cut my teeth trying to live with like a Confederate jacket and Union pants. You get shot by both sides, um, right? Um, but yet some of us are called to honor these two historical poles, although never quite lived there, <laughs> never quite lived there. And uh, I pray that for you, you know, and, and who you are as a people as a movement at this moment, that these two things would be so, so um, available to us to draw on. And I, and I oftentimes say this if I'm a disciple. I say, there are seasons in your life where you will be compartmentalized by the Holy Spirit. And in one season, with one area of your life, you may be operating out of the reformational stream, maybe the way you do your ministry, maybe the way you're hyper contextualizing to get the breakthrough, you know, the classic traits of the reformational stream to do what it takes to get the message, to identify to the point of getting the message in. And there could be a whole other area of your life where the Lord's like, by the way, you've forgotten what a closet prayer life is, and I don't remember the last time you were on your knees till you got a breakthrough, which is the classic pious dream, the spiritual disciplines that exist that are other than contextually what's happened in our lives because they're disciplines <laughs> that yield something. And I sometimes joke, um, at least with our congregants, I'm like, some of you in this room, uh, your halo needs to be tightened. <laughs> you need to get back to some of the pious stream disciplines, or you you will not hear from the Lord the way you want to, simply because uh, you've lost some of the very things that the Lord is choosing to speak from it to you to, in a sense, to recalibrate you. And then there's others I look at in our congregation or in our school, and I say, actually, your halo, your halo is strapped on too tight, and you need to listen to bolts, loosen the bolts because it's cutting off the blood flow to your brain. <laughs> Right. And then you get wild offense like a C speed because this teaching is all great, right? And, until you try to apply it to you, it's really good to understand the other, but then you're like, where am I? So I oftentimes joke like I had a bit of a porn issue and when I was in my 18 and 19 year olds, and then I went into YWAM and I just remember I had a very pious discipler in YWAM. How's that for schizophrenia? Right? This radical reformational group, and I end up sitting under someone who made me read like Benelon and St. Teresa of Avila and, and uh, very pious stream stuff, right? And, and I just remember that uh, that I, I learned quickly, like because of that porn background, I wouldn't even walk into a blockbuster video store alone. I built a discipline, not even to visually stimulate myself by going in. At the same time, I was doing some of the most radical charismatic ministry on the edge, going into bars and seeing the Holy Spirit move and people get healed and getting words of knowledge, right? If you can receive it, right? And I'm like, that's weird that this radical edgy ministry is going on at the same time I have this deep pious spot. And I, that's why I love the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit can do. Right? But the bigger reflection that I want to come from this is, I'm praying for you as a movement, right? To be able to, as a movement, encounter one another. Because these things aren't going away. Now, there's two Old Testament passages. It's always good to have the Bible in there <laughs> as a good evangelical prophet. Remember, there's two, there's two sacrifices of consecration in the Old Testament. One was known as a burnt offering. Remember that one? Burn it all, carry the ashes outside and burn it. You remember what the other one was? A meal offering. Anyone remember what you did with that? By the way, they're both the offerings of consecration. The meal offering, you gave some of it, you brought it to the temple, excuse me, to the tabernacle, you gave some of it to the priest, and you kept some of it and ate it. As a reminder, right, of an identification lifestyle. And I, I, I tend to think that it gives us a hint of these two great poles that God has put in place from the beginning. That I, I want to remind you, only God knows how to steward them as well as God does. The rest of us, we're stumbling through this thing. And I'll be praying for you as you do it. Now that's that. <laughs> but I was told I would also comment to our new Anabaptist center at our seminary, um, which I'm happy to do in a few moments. But um, if you don't mind, I'll just pause there. There's a, there's a little bit of what was on my heart to share with you today. Anyone questions? Anyone want to yell Ichabod and run out of the room? <laughs> Paul, for your charge. 
you know, our, 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 our seminary now has, we're no longer a denominational seminary. We're, um, now we, we would, we steward the intersection of evangelicalism with culture, right? So predominantly we would, for many of our years, consider it a conservative seminary. And, uh, and I think we will always have that as our dominant pole, that we have a way to understand a high view of scripture, a way to understand a transformed life through an encounter with Christ. As axiomatic to everything else, you know, it's going to be the classic things from our, I, I like to refer to us as we steward mainline evangelicalism encounter with culture, because where we can err is toward a fundamentalism, right? Not enough fun, too much damn, not enough mental, <laughs> that's what it tends to be. Um, and so we steward that intersection where the vast majority of what I have to do there as a leadership and culture prop is to make sure that whatever our love is for propositional truth, it's also paired with our posture in the world, right? Who we are in the world, that's how we carry truth. Um, and that's always what we're gonna be. But, well, and, and because of that, we end up uh, attracting unique, we have 35 denominations there and we have a growing Anabaptist community. What do you do with them? <laughs> Aren't you a unique? Um, and two of our top professors of only a seven professor um, mix are Anabaptists. And so that's one of the reasons why we start to just follow what the Spirit's doing in our midst. And we found ourselves in more and more um, conversations with the Anabaptist community, both the pacifistic and the non-resistance branches. And, and so we're getting led into our understanding of how to create a conversation place. Now, here's another thing. We've grown to be the second largest school east of the Rockies for military chaplains. We didn't even try. It just started to happen. We had a UCC minister that used to run the chaplaincy program for the entire National Guard at the Pentagon, take a church about five miles north of us in his retirement. And he was so moved by how difficult, how, how much chaplains are needed in the military, he asked if he could build a program in our school. It's exploding. Um, and all of a sudden, we're like, isn't it hilarious that at the time our military chaplaincy is exploding? Uh, and we know we don't want to become a God and country school. Uh, our Anabaptist wing is, ex is exploding. So I lead classes that have the most interesting conversations. <laughs> and to see what the Spirit does in the space between is so powerful. Um, and so we, we are thrilled that we've been able to embed this Anabaptist Center. We're building out the board for it at the moment. There's some names that I could throw out that you'd be quite familiar with that have already said yes or are in, we're in conversations with them about it. And, uh, and we're trying to build a decent we have Ken Nassinger, a great Mennonite from Southern Lancaster County, who's um, helping to steer it for us. And so it's pretty exciting. I'll have more reports in the year as the programming starts to come together. And here's another thing. We've started three courses now on Anabaptist survey of the uh, Anabaptist history and Anabaptist surveys of theology. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun to go with that. 